Hi, it's Paul Anderson, and in this video I want to dig more deeply into constructing scientific explanations. This has always been a huge part of science, but we want to be a part of science classrooms as well. We want kids constructing their own explanations for how the world works or why events occur. A really good way to do that is through modeling instruction, where students create their own and construct their own cognitive models or mathematical or computational models. It's basically how the world works. Now remember, this video is part of a series of videos I'm doing on scientific inquiry. I've got a bunch of resources, inquiry cards, and graphic organizers that go along with this. But when I was starting to work on constructing explanations, I had a hard time delineating between an explanation and an argument. What is an explanation? An explanation explains how it works. And what I mean by it is the natural world versus a science argument, which explains how you know. Um, what was helpful as I was going through this was an article I read by Osborne and Patterson. I'll put a link in the description down below. Essentially, if you're using evidence to construct a claim or to create a claim that's somewhat in doubt, then you're probably doing an argument, and we'll talk about that in a later video. When you're coming up with an explanation, you're determining a cause and a mechanism for an effect that is not in doubt. What does that mean? Well, every explanation is going to have an explanandum, which is essentially what you're trying to explain. So if we look at these three questions, why did the dinosaurs die out, why do we have seasons, and why do things fall, each of them have an explanandum, which is that thing we're trying to explain. Uh, if we move those over to the right, we find that those are the effects, and those are not in doubt. No one doubts that we have seasons or things fall, or if we ignore birds that dinosaurs die out. What's an explanation going to do? It's going to determine the cause and the mechanism for these effects. So if we look at dinosaurs, for example, you've probably heard a lot of people think there was a massive meteorite impact that threw atmospheric dust into the atmosphere, temperature dropped, and then the dinosaurs died out. And so as we create that explanation, it brings increased understanding to how the world works. And so what explanations do is they really answer those questions of why. Why is the sky blue? Or how do unbalanced forces cause motion? Now I found when kids are doing explanations, a graphic organizer with cause, mechanism, and effect is really helpful. So let's say we're looking at the phenomena of antibiotic resistance. So these bacteria in this Petri dish are resistant to these three antibiotics. So that's going to be the phenomena. So we could put that in the effect. You always put the effect there first. And then we're going to work backwards to determine what's the cause and what's the mechanism. Now, if I were to give you the answer, you've probably heard this before, antibiotic resistance is probably due to overuse and underuse of antibiotics. What's the mechanism? That's going to be natural selection. And so what do we have here? We have a coherent explanation. Now, you might say, I've been doing explanations forever as a science teacher. I was too, but I was probably providing those explanations, just like I did a second ago, I gave you an explanation. And what we want kids doing with this practice is we want them constructing their own explanations. And this is really hard. You as a teacher have to move from the explainer, the sage on the stage, to more of a guide on the side as the students construct their own models, they construct their own explanations over time. Now this is based on that constructivist idea of learning, that we all have an understanding of how the world works and then we have to construct a more coherent understanding. Now when students are doing this, I've found what's helpful is giving them a cross-cutting concept cause and effect that helps them kind of organize their explanations. And also, a fairly recent new pedagogical tool, visual thinking, is helpful as well. We want kids visually showing us their models, what they're thinking. Once that's outside of their brain, on a piece of paper, or on a whiteboard so we can look at it, then we can start to build explanations over time. If we look at a rubric for what makes a good explanation, it should always have a cause and then if we're looking at the model that you're trying to explain, you should identify the relevant components of the model, and then how do those connections explain, describe, and predict. These would be the elements of a good explanatory model. Now, if it's an advanced model, you may add numbers to that, mathematically representing some of the elements of that model, or use computational modeling. I've gone into all of this, a video I made on modeling instruction, I'll put a link in the description down below. But if you're just getting started, this is a graphic organizer that I use with 
with students on the left side. I've got also a teacher version of it. So you could look at like what I think are the big elements that you should use as a teacher. But what we essentially want them doing is telling us what they think. And so let's say we're looking at these birds that are dipping. As kids are just getting started constructing these explanatory models, you probably want to give them the question that they're trying to answer. In this case, what causes the birds to keep dipping? Now we want them to create a model. You can think of this as an explanation, explanatory model, or if you want to call it an explanatory hypothesis, it's essentially what they're thinking at this point. Now it's important that since they're going to be drawing a model or a system model, that you curate the important parts that you want in that model. So in this case, if we're looking at this dipping bird, I might tell students that I want the bird included in the model, that cup that they're dipping into, and maybe the surroundings are important as well. And then you want to define the system that you want them to create a model for. Define the boundary in space and time. Lots of times when kids are creating a model, they'll just draw a diagram or a picture, which has no explanation in it at all. And so I would say, I want you to draw the bird in an upright position and then a down position so I can understand what you're thinking. Now we let the kids go. We let them create an explanatory model. This is an example of what that might look like. The student believes that what's causing those birds to dip is gas pressure. Or this would be another explanatory model. Maybe they believe it has to do with density changes within the bird. Or capillary action is a very common kind of a, a system model when we're looking at an explanation for the bird. But you also want to have a spot where they tell me what they're thinking. What's your explanation or what's your cause? I want you to write that out so I understand what you're thinking. Other common explanations if we're looking at this might be momentum is causing it to occur or that we've got a temperature change that causes it to occur. And so now you as a teacher know what all the explanations are in the class. And the next step is to test those models, to test those explanations out. So if we look at where this fits in this whole idea of inquiry, we start with a phenomena. We use questions to develop a lot of explanations or you could call those models of what we're thinking. But now we're going to systematically test each of those. That's why we do scientific investigations. Some of those models will fall apart. Some of those will have elements that are we can kind of combine into a shared classroom model of what we're all thinking. And this is how you can use inquiry in the classroom to construct models as we're all working together. And it also builds that sense of um, I'm invested if a student is testing out the models that's based on what they actually believe. If, let me give you an example of this. I was using this phenomena. I was working with some teachers at American Community School in Amman. So this is a fourth grade classroom. And then their teacher, Jake Owens, what he did is create a driving question board where he put all of their questions up. He then put all of their models up. And then the students are systematically going through and doing investigations to test those explanations to see which ones are wrong and which ones are right. Nice thing about science is there's going to be one reason for why this occurs. And so we can all work together to find that one explanation. So that's constructing scientific explanations. It's what scientists have always done, but we want our students constructing that as well. And I hope that was helpful.